May 5th, 1940. The Germans invade Holland. My name is Taka Lubertz. My name is Taka Lubertz. I have just returned from visiting my parents in Leovarden, Holland. There I saw Jews from my hometown with their suitcases and belongings being loaded onto the trains. I knew then that Immy and I had to do something. The time was 1943 in Nazi-occupied Holland. The people, Taka and Immy Lubertz, two courageous and unassuming people, who sensed instinctively that they had to do something to defy the Nazi cruelty that was turning Europe into a graveyard for millions of Jews. They decided early on, at great personal risk to themselves and their growing young family, that they would assist as many victims as they could. By the time liberation came, two years later, approximately 200 people had passed through the safe house provided by the Luberts. The Luberts were repeatedly warned that they were taking too many chances, but their response was always the same. How can we refuse anyone who needs shelter? Who are these remarkable people? Taka and Immy Luberts married in 1934 in Leoparden, a town in northern Holland where both families lived. He was 23 and she was 20. Their wedding was a simple affair. First, they had the required civil ceremony in town hall. From there, the whole wedding party traveled by horse and buggy to church to consecrate their vows. The Luberts settled into a modest life in a rented home in Oldmarkt where Taka taught third, fourth, and fifth grade in a state-supported parochial school. With a worldwide depression, times were difficult, but they managed. They began to have a family. First, Garrett, followed by Herm, Nick, and Tom. Bernhard Leopold, named after Queen Wilhelmina's husband, came next. And finally, a daughter, Grace. As the couple was caring for its ever-expanding family, Germany invaded and occupied the Netherlands. The Dutch were taken by complete surprise. Throughout World War I, Holland had been allowed to remain neutral and had fully intended to remain so during World War II. This time, the Germans had a different agenda for their Dutch neighbor. ID cards. Declarations of Aryanism. Rationing. And the dreaded razzias, or roundups of Dutch men to be sent to Germany for forced labor, or worse. The Dutch tried to resist many of these measures with labor strikes and other protests. But the usual Nazi response was more repressive measures and retaliation. The resistance went underground, organized around small groups of men who operated under assumed names. By 1943, German soldiers had tightened their grip around Holland, helped by Dutch collaborators. The underground had also become more tightly organized and reached into the smaller towns, such as Oldmark. One important activity was secretly publishing and distributing newspapers to inform Dutch citizens what was really happening and to give them hope. It was a dangerous activity. Those caught were immediately shot. In 1943, Taka and Emmy Luberts were approached by their minister to help deliver newspapers and other secret documents. They agreed without hesitation. Before long, the Luberts became leaders in such underground operations as stealing ration coupons from the town hall safe and delivering them to people in hiding. Destroying the town census records so Nazis could not use them and bringing downed British and American pilots to protective homes. One day, two distant cousins appeared on Mr. and Mrs. Lubert's doorstep. 
not wanting to raise their hand in the German salute and Sig Heil. They had gone AWOL from the German army. Could the Luberts shelter them? The Luberts could not refuse. And so their home became an interim hiding place for those who needed shelter. Mr. Luberts took a few days vacation to go back to Leovarden to visit his parents. He took a walk in the neighborhood of the train station. There, he came upon a group of people carrying bags and suitcases. He saw desperation and fear in their faces. When he came home, he told his wife, we are helping other Dutch people hide, but the big trouble is for the Jews. They are in real danger. They have no place to go. Now, the Luberts knew they could be shot if they were caught hiding Jews. Even the children were at risk. Mrs. Lubert spent a sleepless night, worried. She was afraid for the children. In the morning, she went to her minister and asked, if something should happen to me or my husband, would you take care of the children and bring them to relatives in another city? The minister agreed. Feeling more at ease, she prayed, and then she took Jews into her house. The Luberts are not saints, but they are people with a clear moral vision and the courage to see that vision through to its appropriate conclusion. They demonstrated then and for the remainder of the war that there are alternatives to passive complicity. They exhibited the kind of behavior that can inspire faith in the resilience and essential goodness of the human spirit, even in the face of absolute evil. Europe may have been ravaged by the diseases of hatred and complicity, but there were at least some who did not succumb. First, there was Miriam, whose dark hair was bleached red. Next appeared her fiancé, Benjamin Ginsburg. Forgery was required to remove the large J from Miriam's papers denoting her Jewish origin and to extend Benjamin's leave. To the Lubert's children, Miriam and Benjamin became known as Aunt Reek and Uncle Pete. Later came Dr. and Mrs. Jacques Adler. With an infant daughter, the underground could not find them a shelter. Even though Emmy Luberts was herself seven months pregnant, or because of it, she agreed to take them in. In October, Cor, the seventh child, was born, and the Luberts' three-bedroom rented home was becoming very crowded. As Miriam remembers, there were days and weeks that it looked as if the war would never end, and they would forever live with that awful fear day and night. And there were the children who saw all that was going on. One evening, Taka and Emmy gathered them together and said, whatever we do here in this house, or whoever comes here, that is our family's business, and we never tell strange people about it. And as young as they were, they never did. Garrett and Herm were by this time able to help their parents. Although going out at night was forbidden, Garrett would accompany his father when he went out illegally at night to deliver banned newspapers and illegal ration coupons. Herm helped gather wool from a neighboring farmer's sheep. He organized his brothers and friends to chase herds of sheep under wire fences. While their heavy fleece protected the sheep from injury, the boys managed to collect quite a bit of wool from the fences as the sheep ran by. His parents always wondered how Herm managed to collect all that badly needed wool. For over two years, the Luberts risked their lives and their children's lives repeatedly in the process of providing food, shelter, and transportation for over 200 people, over 50 of whom were Jews facing almost certain death in Hitler's Holocaust. When the Canadians liberated Oldemark in May 1945, the neighbors were amazed to find that so many Jewish people had been living in the Lubert's home. The British and the United States officials wrote letters and awarded medals to commend the Luberts for the rescue of British and American pilots. General Eisenhower wrote a special thank you. Mr. Luberts received special recognition and status as a member of the Dutch underground. 
In 1956, the Luberts family, expanded by the addition of Florence and Rena, decided to come to the United States to seek a better life for their children. Through a friend, Mr. Luberts was able to find employment in Rochester and a furnished home and a warm welcome from neighbors who had learned about what they had done during the war. In 1978, the Adlers and Ginsburgs, who began a new life in Israel, testified to the members of the Committee on Righteous Gentiles at Yad Vashem, the official Holocaust memorial and museum in Israel, about how the Luberts hid them. In November 1979, the Luberts went to Israel, where they were officially awarded righteous Gentile status and given a beautiful medal, which states, whoever saves one life, saves an entire universe. They planted a tree on the Avenue of the Righteous, a place reserved for those few rescuers whom it could be certified had risked their lives to save the lives of Jews. The Jewish tradition teaches that for the sake of 36 just people, the world is sustained. A person who saves but one life is considered as if he had saved an entire world. Hundreds of worlds were saved by these good people. You see these worlds reflected in the smiling, living faces of the children and grandchildren of the Adlers and Ginsburgs living in Israel. The spreading branches of your tree of life, the lives that you helped maintain, extend in all directions, touching even our hearts. Thank you for what you did and for who you are.